it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Miller, who is uh, a sixth year uh, PhD student uh, who arrived at Iowa from Vanderbilt, having already uh, some ancient language work, including Syriac under his belt. Uh, as you'll see, he's gonna introduce us to the fascinating world of Aramaic and, and Syriac speaking Christianity. Uh, while here at Iowa, he's done great work uh, as a teacher and a researcher, having won several different teaching awards. Uh, he feels uh, very much at home in the undergraduate classroom. He's already participated as a presenter at several conferences and has interests in history of the book and digital humanities. He's pursuing uh, for uh, those of uh, you who are interested, uh, I encourage you to talk to him about the uh, digital humanities graduate certificate. Uh, he's in that program. Uh, and he has uh, finished or is completing a digital project, which uh, kind of combines a lot of his different skills and interests. Uh, so I could go on, uh, but I will just note that uh, he is uh, finishing up his dissertation uh, and he is doing so uh, with a Ballard and Seashore Fellowship and uh, I've had uh, a great deal of uh, fun reading through his, uh, his fascinating work in the, in the past three or four months or so. So uh, I'll be quiet now and turn the floor over to Peter. All right, uh, well, thank you for the very generous introduction, Paul. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through the standard uh, start of presentation rigmarole of getting my PowerPoint up and working. Uh, so it should now be visible. Um, and thank you again to everyone for being here. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and get going. Um, so in the mid seventh century, the Catholicos Ishayab III wanted to build a school at a monastery called Bethabe, a crown jewel to complete the construction and dedication of a new church sanctuary or temple that he had just completed funding. The report of this attempt uh, indicates that his motivation was, quote, that every child who was trained and instructed within the monastery might be near at hand for becoming a disciple, so that the school and the monastery might become one, the school to give birth to and rear scholars, and the monastery to teach and sanctify them for the labors of the ascetic life. The monks soundly refused, first making their position known in a gathered speech, and then digging up the sacred bones of their founder, Jacob, and leaving, abandoning the monastery until Ishoyab relented and built his school in a village instead. This account recorded in Thomas of Marga's Book of the Governors highlights the dynamic relationship between monasteries, schools, and church hierarchies in the East Syrian world. Today, I want to highlight this presentation in this presentation my research into this tension the place of monasteries and schools within this church, and what day-to-day -day training to become a monk in the sixth and seventh century East Syrian world might have looked like. Uh, but let's start with some of the basics and background. Syriac is a language of great importance and geographic spread in the late ancient and medieval worlds. As a dialect of Aramaic, it is a cousin of Hebrew and Arabic in the Semitic language family which originated in the city of Urhai, better known by its Hellenic name of Edessa in the ancient world, now modern Urfa. The movement of Syriac through the world is often tied specifically to Christian missionary activities into Persia, where Christian communities would become a significant religious minority under the Sasanian Persian Empire. Our particular focus today will be on the Church of the East, which came to autocephaly or independent self-governance in the early fifth century amid political and doctrinal disputes, the fine details of which I will spare you today. After breaking communion with the Greek and Roman churches, the distinctly Persian branch of Christianity would flourish along the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates, including founding several theological academies and participating in the translation of Greek texts into Syriac and eventually Arabic. Uh, 
the modern Assyrian Church of the East, with around 400,000 adherents around the world, still uses Syriac Aramaic as a liturgical language today. In the interest of scope, we will be investigating a particular slice of this wide ranging church and its two millennium history. Chronologically, I want to focus today on three flashpoints of time. The most important of these comes in the sixth century when Abraham of Kashkar assumes control of a largely defunct monastery and creates a new monastic rule there on the Mount Isla Ridge. Abraham's work, which we will discuss in more detail in a few minutes, creates what I will be terming reform monasticism. It is a movement of transition, an inflection point in East Syrian monastic history. Abraham and his successors at the great monastery revitalized monastic life in the region, and monks would train under these rules, then go out and found new monasteries modeled after them. But to make some sense of this inflection point, uh, we can look at earlier monastic and ascetic practices in Syria to understand what Abraham was reforming. Our focus here will be on the late fourth and fifth century accounts. We will also be attentive to the legacy of Abraham's reforms in the centuries to follow. The seventh and eighth century provides a rich tapestry of monastic authors trained in this reform monastic milieu whose work reflects more than a century of systematization and refinement of this model. Uh, I should also note here, in the interest of fitting in about an hour, we will be focusing in particular on the reforms and their legacy and less so on the predecessors today. Geographically, we're gonna be focusing on a few monasteries, cities, and regions. Most of these regions are within the realm of the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire's Eastern neighbor. Border disputes along this frontier, including full-scale military campaigns, were always a possibility. It is important to remember, though, that even as civic leadership changed hands in these military offensive, large swaths of the population remained in place while others were forced to move and relocate. Take the city of Nisibis, a much desired border city with a fort and a strategic location for trade. When the Roman Emperor Julian launched a military campaign into Persia and was killed in 363 CE, the price of securing peace enough for his eventual successor Jovian to consolidate power in that vacuum was the city of Nisibis and its surrounding provinces near the Tigris. Syriac-speaking Christians who had lived in Nisibis under Roman rule evacuated and established a theological school at Edessa until disputes over Christology compelled the Emperor Zeno to close the school in 489 leading to the scholars return to Nisibis a century later, establishing the School of Nisibis, a central point for theological education for East Syrian Christians for centuries to follow. While Nisibis will serve as our archetype and point of reference for a theological academy for the body of evidence we have for it, other important cities of note having academies include Gundashapur, known as Beth Lapat in Aramaic, and Seleucia Ctesiphon. Following the shift to Muslim control of the region, Nineveh, near modern-day Mosul, would see increased importance as well as a site of church and imperial administration, including a bishop's throne. Near Nisibis, we find the ridge known as Mount Isla, where Abraham founded the great monastery. Tur Abdin became home to a variety of monasteries, some aligned with the Church of the East and some not. Abraham's foundation of the monastery near Nisibis and its school was not a coincidence, and the two institutions benefited greatly from their mutual proximity. From the disciples of Abraham and his successors at Mount Isla, particularly known for the fortification called Tur of Din, monasteries spread across Upper Mesopotamia. Of particular interest to us today is the monastery of Beth Abe, from my opening anecdote. Beth Abe traces its lineage through Jacob a disciple from Mount Isla who settled in the region of Marga and founded a monastery there. By the ninth century, this region between the upper Zab and Tigris rivers would house at least 20 known named monasteries. Our last region of note today is Beth Katraya, notable for being the birthplace of several very important seventh century authors. While not specifically investigating any monasteries there today, I do want to take note that these systems of monastic organization here mirror the developments from Northern Mesopotamia 
in the seventh century, monks and church officials from Beth Katria, who we will be seeing today, would be seated throughout Mesopotamia as monastic leaders and bishops. When it comes to our primary sources on this topic, we have a surprisingly varied set of texts that help us assemble our picture. For our early accounts, we look largely to the work of the Bishop Theodoret of Cyrus, whose collections of the lives of 30 notable Syrian ascetics catalogs small hagiographies of the varied practices and disciplines before Abraham's reforms. Notable among these are the master-disciple relationships uh, given evidence in the life of Julian Saba, and the often extreme forms of asceticism that garnered great amounts of ancient and modern attention, most famously the pillar saint Simeon the Silite depicted here. The monastic rules of the great monastery of Abraham are recorded in various collections, as are those of several of his successors at Mount Isla. The most prominent for us today is his successor, Dadisho. These help us to see what structures and rules the leaders of these monasteries were attempting to impose on the monks under their care. For the nearby school of Nisibis, the recently published source book by Adam Becker is a treasure trove of material, as is his monograph, The Fear of God and the Beginning of Wisdom, which treats the history and administration of this school in fantastic detail. Here we find speeches, accounts, and the semi-monastic rule governing student life at the institution as well. And Nani Sho, around this time, translated a set of texts that would come to be known as the Paradise of the Fathers, offering reflections on the early movements of monasticism, particularly in Egypt, but with the lens and viewpoint of monks who believed Abraham's reforms were the culmination of that tradition. Of those texts that let us look beyond Abraham's lifetime to the legacy of these reforms in the following centuries, our primary text for today is that of Thomas of Marga's The Book of the Governors, a localized history of just one monastery but its neighbors and intersecting bishops. We will also be relying in part on Ishod Na's Book of Chastity, a surprisingly brief collection of 140 biographical sketches that often provide our only biographical details for things such as birth, birthplace and date and death for authors of the time period. And finally, we have a brief survey of seventh and eighth century authors who are writing not just about, but for monks. Dadi Shokatraya's treatise on the solitude of the seven weeks uh, is an, an important series of letters offering instruction on how to prepare to endure a notoriously difficult stage of monastic development. Shemon the Graceful's Discourse on the Solitary Life is a graduation address of sorts, a speech that marks an occasion when a monk is elevated to hold their own cell and is full of reminders and descriptions of how to stay on this path. And the work of Joseph Chaziah, also known as Joseph the Visionary, who treats in detail the three stages of monastic life, outlining the process of advancement and the challenges of each phase. With this background and core texts set, I want to turn then to the first major topic of the day, Namely, what is the relationship between the monastery and school in the East Syrian world? Why do some monasteries thrive with schools while others, monks would rather abandon their cells than face having to be in proximity to teaching or God forbid, having to teach themselves? To explore this, let's briefly survey the reasons that the monks of Beth Abbe give us for refusing that additional school. Thomas of Marga reports Kamisho's refusal to the Catholicos Ishoyab, and it goes like this. It is not good for us monks while sitting in our cells to be disturbed by the sound of the chanting of psalms and the singing of the hymns of the offices, and by the noise of the voices of the schoolboys and of those who keep watch by night. We have neither found it in writing, nor have we received it by report that such a thing as this ever took place in any of the monasteries of the fathers. We are destined for weeping and mourning while we dwell in our cells, according to the doctrine which we have learned from our books, and we have received this from our father, Mar Jacob. For during his lifetime and on his departure from us, he did not command us that one should teach another to sing and to read offices from books. <clears throat> 
Cease then from this effort to make us to become schoolboys again. And instead, let each man dwell in his cell and let each man read by himself. If, however, you wish to build a school, behold all the towns and villages and the land around them. The whole land of Persia is your dominion. Build then whatever you wish. But in this monastery, a school shall not be built. For if you build a school here, we will leave. Thomas of Marga was a monk and secretary at Beth Ave, having enrolled as a young man in the 830s, about 200 years after this incident. Around 850, he composed his text, known in English primarily as the Book of the Governors, but perhaps better translated as the Book of Abbots. This history recounts in five books the history of Beth Abbe, starting with Abraham of Kashkar's reforms at Mount Isla, though the focus of the first book is largely on Jacob, who would go on to found the monastery Thomas now dwelt within. The rest of the books account for the history of the monastery from its founding in about 595 through Thomas's own life in the mid 9th century, including the movement of monks, theological controversies, and the appointment and actions of bishops in the region. Several features of Kamisho's reported response raise questions about the preparation of monks and their training and their lives within the monastery. We know from elsewhere in Thomas's account that Beth Abbe had both a koinobium and a space for monks living in cells. Under Dadisho's administration at Mount Isla, the rule which would have been a model for Beth Abbe, his rule specifies, brothers who come shall be examined for three years in the koinobium. Then if they have behaved themselves well, permission will be granted to them that they build for themselves cells. If they have behaved differently, let them go in peace. And when they depart from the koinobium, if they have behaved rightly, the whole body shall help them for three days. If there are empty cells, these shall be given to them. This arrangement is a fairly common one in reformed monastic communities and seems to borrow in particular from the organizational models of the monasteries of Abba Macarius of Egypt, a monastery Abraham of Kashkar is reported to have visited and stayed in in his life before returning to Persia to found the monastery of Mount Isla. In this monastic tradition, new initiates live within the common houses of the Koinobium for several years, performing manual labor for the monastery, attending to the daily offices of prayer at appointed times of day, singing psalms, and attending communal meals in the evening. After a period of time that demonstrated sufficient advancement and a readiness for isolation, the monk was given or built a cell in which they would become a solitary in the Hidaya. Given that Beth Abe had a koinobium with these monks already performing the offices and singing the psalms at the appointed times they're ready to complain about, the objection seems out of place. The answer that I then locate is in the objections over the voices of the schoolboys in particular. In the monastic rules for Mount Isla, we find again that Abraham's successor Dadi Show added a rule, this time requiring that all monks coming to the monastery must already be able to read. In other monastic settings, including the Egyptian monasteries of Pacomius and Shanuta, or the Palestinian monastery of Sabas, those enrolling in the monastery without the ability to read were offered initial instruction so they could participate in the reading of psalms and prayers. So if Dadi Show insisted that monks already be able to read Syriac before joining, where did devotees seeking the monastic life learn their literacy? We have two options. The most prominent and prestigious such location is the School of Nisibis or its associated academies. Here, the instruction, while not fully known or understood, can be deduced in at least broad strokes from the titles of its instructors, beginning with the syllable reader, the Imhagyana, then the full reader, or Makriyane, and finally the exegete, or Mafshkana. Prominent academies in urban centers such as Nisibis provided a centralized place for a full course in education from initial letter forms up through theological composition and exegesis in the strict and literal Antiochene tradition. But not every monk pursued the theological academy as a place of instruction. More commonly, it was the job of the little recognized village school to impart an initial literacy in a Bible-centered education. 
These schools were often attached to villages, or to village monasteries or churches, and instruction was the duty of priests, monks, or the, mem the members of the Bene Kiyama, the children of the covenant who formed a devoted and semi-monastic way of life dating about as far back as Syriac Christian records can take us. The story of the life of Mar Aha from the Book of Governors offers us a glimpse of what village schools were like. Uh, Thomas of Marga accounts. Now this village of Awach was very famous for its fear of God and concerning its church, it is said that there were 70 priests in it at one time. And it came to pass that the blessed Maraha and a brother of his named Shupal Maran were left fatherless for their father died when they were little children and the believing woman, their mother, brought them up until they arrived at years of discretion. And they went forth from their village and came with their mother to Shalmath, a village in Shaf Shafa, and entered the school there. And they were maintained by the labor and care of the venerable woman, their mother, who was worthy of remembrance for her good. And they studied divine doctrine. And when they had come to the estate of manhood, they too came and made themselves disciples in this monastery. Who is a different person than Mar Aha uh, from Mount Isla this time indicates that the course of study that sees children in a village school read through the Bible occurs in stages and takes about seven years. Enrollment in the village school seems to have begun around the age of 10 and ended for those finishing the course around the age of 17 or 18. I should briefly note here that the distinction in language I am making in English between a village school, a monastic school, and an academy is in some ways an artificial one, as all are termed escole in Syriac. A loan word from the Greek skole, meaning school. I've chosen to delineate these terms for its simplicity and presentation and to highlight these different categories. Notably, we have accounts of students studying first in a village school and later moving on to academies like Nisibis for further study, and then additional accounts of those leaving Nisibis to join a monastery. So when students enroll in the academy, they may have begun already with simple reading exercises accomplished, ready to move on to more advanced studies, presumably by demonstrating their reading ability to a teacher. Many alumni of the School of Nisibis, when their course of study in exegesis and theology was complete, would move on to monastic life or ecclesial office, and many abbots or devout monks were tapped for episcopal thrones or special missionary dispensations, particularly eastward. Thus, from this brief inquiry into why the monastery of Beth Abbe refused a school, we can build a rough map of the possible routes through which the religious and academic system available to an East Syrian Christian could be navigated. From this sketch chart, then, we can trace avenues of available pursuits. A young person could enroll in a village school or academy to begin with, and from either of those could come to dwell in a monastery. The place as a scholar or theologian at an academy or a sufficiently advanced monk in a monastery were both possible springboards into service as a bishop or metropolitan, and retiring bishops and metropolitans often resigned to withdraw as monks. A porous boundary between these educational tracks in which the village school served as a common anchor toward asceticism, academic pursuits, or church office helps us build a picture of the entwined fabrics of the Church of the East. But let's return to Kamisho's refusal to allow a school at Beth Abe. Why did Isho Ayab insist on one, and why did Kamisho refuse? Isho Ayab's rationale for building a school was premised, it would seem, on the belief that a school in which students lived and worked in the monastery would predispose them to join as monks, building up the monastery's numbers and influence of the institution. He believes this is the best course for the monastery, the villages, and the people of the region. Kamisho, by contrast, is appalled at the idea. His refusal is premised on the inherited rules of Abraham and Dadisho from Mount Isla through their founder, Jacob. Monks are given no place to teach children in these rules, quite the contrary. Novices must already be literate, and any instruction in the koinobium must be tied to the labors of the monastery specifically, not the academy. Porous as the boundaries may be, Kamisho and his congregation do not see themselves as a school. They are a monastery. 
Monasteries and, and churches in villages may have schools, but there cannot be a school here where the pursuit of holy solitude is the aim of the ascetic life. For the monks here, their time in schools is behind them and they have moved on to the labor of the spirit. Here at about the halfway mark of my presentation then, I wanna make a brief pivot. This tension between monastic leaders, bishops and academic institutions with their multivalent pressures and interests occupies largely the first half of my dissertation research. But I wanna turn now to what it would be like to train as a monk in one of these reform monasteries. And my approach to this topic, as well as the above discussion, is framed in large part by the works of Michel de Certeau, a French Jesuit philosopher and author of The Practice of Everyday Life. Relevant to this study is his notion of strategy and tactics. In a criminally brief uh, introduction to this idea, de Certeau uses strategy to describe imposed structures of power that people must navigate. His metaphor is rooted in maps and urban planning. Think of the grid system present in downtown Iowa City with its one-way streets, regular stops, and neat alignments. This is the strategy, the grid to navigate, the board across which we move the game pieces of our lives. Our tactics are the individual actions that help us move through this space. I live on a one-way street here in Iowa City, and I see people regularly making the, let's call it tactical decision to drive the wrong way on this one-way street. This might save them time and gas on their way to their destination. If you've ever cut through a corner parking lot to avoid a line of cars at a red light, you've navigated tactically. This system, I believe, fits quite naturally within the realm of educational studies of the ancient world, where the curriculum imposed by teachers compared to the students' means of survival and the navigation of the expectations of those teachers can be understood in terms of make a slight alteration to Desertos' original model by incorporating the work of Bernard Lahira in what he terms plural actor theory. Rather than a singular imposition of power or assuming a regular uh, point of contact in all scenarios, plural actor theory reminds us of the complexity of our identities and reactions. I might act differently if I'm choosing to centralize my identity as a son, brother, scholar, student, or teacher. I similarly must navigate not just the immediate imposition of my superiors, hi Paul, uh, but layered systems and grids of structures stacked like overhead transparencies. At a student of a public institution, I have to navigate a contractual agreement between myself and my department, the graduate college housing that department, the city, the state, the country. While the most local form of oversight is what I likely think about and act upon most regularly, I have a plurality of identities intersecting with those varied impositions upon me. If we then return to consider the monastic initiate, they carry differing elements of identity, ranging from language background, gender, region of origin, economic status, language, access to, uh, access to materials that can be different if they were raised in a rural or urban center, whether their status is enslaved, freed, or free, and differences in bodily and mental functions. When applying themselves in what Theodoret terms the usual labors in pursuit of the wealth of philosophy awaiting the pious ascetic, these monks must navigate their abbot's oversight, the rule of the monastery, episcopal decrees, shifting frontiers and theological disputes, changing imperial control of the region, the expectation of orthodoxy, and perhaps most important to remember, an anxiety over a looming final judgment that their discipline aims to remind them of constantly. Rather than a single map, a complex series of layers, sometimes in conflict with one another, must be navigated day to day. A novice may be forced to, weather, to wonder if their practice lies outside the realm of orthodoxy, whether to support a bishop of the region's authority over the interest of their own abbot. And it is important to recall that the consequences of these are not just the daily threats of punishment and repercussion from the abbot, but an eschatological anxiety over coming judgments. With this background in mind, I want to summarize the aim of the second half of my dissertation, where I focus on three dimensions of education identified by seventh century sources. Dadi Shokatraya, one of the seventh century theologians originally from the region near modern day Qatar, summarized this well in his commentary on the ascetic of Abba Isaiah. He writes, 
Abba Isaiah wishes to teach us that the entire conduct of the solitaries, this being divided up into three distinct parts, the bodily labors, the conduct of the mind, and the spiritual contemplation is depicted in symbol in the holy scriptures in what was done by and to various holy persons. We know sadly little about the life of Dadisho Katraya, save that he was born in Beth Katraya and eventually joined a monastery at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. This outlook isn't limited to Dadisho, however. Joseph Kaziah's letter on the three steps of the monastic life is divided into the work of body, mind, and spirit as well. If we consider these three dimensions of ascetic training, the curriculum or syllabus of the monastery, I believe we can better understand the unique place the monastery carves for itself in that system of village school, monastery, and academy we have seen. In this section, then, we will imagine what training in a monastery like Beth Abbe would be like for a new novitiate in the 7th or early 8th century. Since literacy was a prerequisite for entry to the monastery, let us start with the work of the mind. In a local village school, the study of language was centered first and foremost on the Bible, again taking place between about the ages of 10 and 17. In The Cause of the Nativity by Thomas of Edessa, we get a surprisingly detailed glimpse of this process of basic acquisition of literacy. He writes, and if someone should express a desire to grow in his teaching, then teach to him the Aleph, the Beit, first, and then the teaching and naming and reading aloud of the word Abgad, or alphabet. And after these, the Psalms, and in them also instruction in reading. When this is complete, next for him is instruction in the writing of a manuscript from biblical text. And thus following all these things, give to him for reading volumes of commentary for guidance and comprehension of the divine books. Thomas of Edessa was himself a sixth century affiliate of the school of Nisibis. And while it is fair to assume that the process that includes uh, training in writing and the composition of commentary may not have been fully available at the level of village school, the base process of starting with letters and advancing to syllables and words, and then the meaning of longer portions of text at a time was a likely regimen we can assume existed within village schools attached to local churches. While it is obscured slightly by the English, Thomas very cleverly bridges the gap between reading letters and reading words by naming the first two letters of the Syriac alphabet, then transitioning to the word abgad, which is written using the first four consonants of the Syriac alphabet, but pronounced with vowels. I just think that's really neat. Thomas has here allowed the reader who is uh, reading his text aloud to perform the pedagogical step in question, moving from letters to the pronunciation of syllables with vowels. This general progression is strikingly close to the organization of teachers at the School of Nisibis, in which levels of teaching uh, were, again, the instructor of syllables, the reading instructor, and finally, the exegete. At every level, the Bible was central to the process of learning to read, and thus was the bedrock of other literary and intellectual pursuits, including theology, the philosophy of Aristotle, or history. Within the monastery in particular, the work of the mind was dedicated in no small part to the reading and recitation of the Psalms from a daily Psalter. Additional effort in the monitoring of one's thoughts and surroundings for demons or pitfalls was an important element, but one we will return to when we consider the work of the spirit in a moment. The reading of texts, including the Bible, biblical commentary, the sayings of the fathers, and collected homilies of earlier figures prominent in the church, such as Theodore of Mopsuestia, Basil of Caesarea, or Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, were routine fixtures of the intellectual life of the monastery. And by the time Thomas of Marga in the mid ninth century, uh, one of the books, or sorry, by the time of Thomas of Marga in the mid ninth century, one of these commonly read books was Anani Show's Paradise of the Fathers. This translation from Greek of several prominent works on early Egyptian monasticism of the third and fourth century was a runaway success in Syriac monastic communities, with Thomas claiming that every monastery in Persia had a copy. The process of reading and copying these stories was seen as virtuous in its own right, 
as the narratives instructed the reader, while copying it glorified the saints through the hand of the scribe. The conditioning of the body for ascetic life, once we have met our prerequisite for entry, was likely a difficult shift for many. Even in the Koinobium, our imagined novice must train themselves to eat a meal once per day, adjust their sleep schedule to fit the demands of the hours. Um, and while construction of the daily life of an East Syrian monk 1300 years ago may seem daunting, we are aided greatly here by the writings of Shemon the Graceful. Shemon was a late seventh century monk and physician famous for his book of grace, which seems to have become his namesake. Though today our interest is in his shorter work, The Discourse on the Solitary Life. The speech is notable in part because it is both by and for a monk. In it, we find instructions from a monastic superior offering guidance, reminders, and warnings about the joys and dangers of life in a cell. In describing the elements of that life of the koinobium that are best forgotten at this stage, we can begin to put together a picture of what our novice is likely up to. The most prominent organizing factor of a monk's life was the monastic hours, compulsory times for prayer at set moments of the day, often marked by the tolling of a bell or striking of a board. The pulses of multiple daily gatherings for the recitation of psalms shaped both the contours of the monk's movement through their landscape, but also gave rhythm to a daily soundscape. Prayers involved the movements of the body, including standing, bowing, prostration, kneeling, and as Dottie Show writes, beating your head against the ground before the cross. Such movements may have been made more difficult by the kinds of manual labor uh, that, the Koinobium, that monks of the Koinobium performed on behalf of the monastery. Sources like the Book of the Governors provide a few examples of this work, including positions for scribes, secretaries, water fetchers, field workers, animal herders, kitchen staff, and even monks responsible for the delivery of goods for sale and the movement of money between the monastery and local areas of commerce. Monks working in the fields may have tended cattle, sheep, or goats, while those tending plants would have likely seen to the care of grapes, grains, olives, figs, dates, onions, beans, or lentils. The monastic diet was characterized by a lack of meat, and so a plant-based meal, usually consisting of bread, oil, and a few vegetables, was the normal daily allotment, with onions serving as a recurring food in the Book of the Governors that marked the piety of those who could eat but one of them a day. Fruits such as dates and figs were nutrient and calorie-rich options that could be easily dried and stored, perhaps against famine or through the perfect period between harvests. Egyptian monasteries of the Pacomian Federation are reported to have baked their bread once each year and then store the loaves to be consumed as a kind of heart tack. Unfortunately, the quality and frequency of bread baking in East Syrian monasteries is not immediately evident, but we must consider the possibility of a bread more like a cracker than a loaf of bread um, that we would characterize. Meals were held in the evening and would convene in the central assembly hall of the monks of the Kenobium as well as the solitaries who were keeping only single day isolation who would join for this meal. As Dadi Shokatraya describes, there was a standard progression of isolation as deeper and more profound withdrawal from the world and even from other monks uh, characterized a more difficult but more sacred practice. In Dadi Sho's estimation, the progression started when the novice joined the Koinobium, who would eventually become an Ihidaya or solitary. The solitary would move from the labors of the koinobium to support the brothers with economic benefit to the labors of the cell, where focus would shift to the work of the mind and a life centered on constant prayer in imitation of the angels and the reading of scripture as the goal. At first, the isolation was just for a day's duration, with the solitary emerging once per day for that gathered meal. When the solitary was ready for a harsher regimen as determined by their expression of interest and the uh, consent of the abbot, they entered the solitude of the weekdays, emerging only on Saturdays after sundown to participate in the weekly celebration of the mass and to receive the mystery of the Eucharist. The next step is what Dadi Show calls the solitude of the seven weeks, a rigorous practice in which 
for three seven week long periods of the liturgical calendar, including Lent, which we are now in. So if you are here, you are breaking your solitude. Um, the monk would not emerge at all, not even to receive Eucharist. Above even the solitude of the seven weeks was a full withdrawal that Dadi Show ascribes to the perfect solitude of the anchorites whose withdrawal functionally separated them from the Koinobian. Should our imaginary novice earn the consecration of a cell, that small dwelling would have a few items. Repeated commands by both Dadi Show and Shemong to read from the scriptures and works of theological commentary of monastic authors indicates that solitaries had access to a few books, including their Psalter, likely a Bible, and one or two relevant pieces of writing. A collected volume such as Enani Show's Paradise of the Fathers is a likely candidate for a repository of such documents, though it's important to recall that manuscripts and Syriac volumes often contain what we would consider as modern readers multiple distinct works running one after another in sequence. A single codex could contain several commentaries, letters, and collections of sayings deemed profitable for the monk. Most monasteries seem to have had libraries where scribes and bookbinders could assemble new codices for monks commissioned to their cell. Aha and Shubal Maran, the fatherless brothers we discussed earlier, uh, went on to train in these exact specialties, in fact. Aha, a scribe, and Shubal Maran, a bookbinder. Um, Shemon's instruction to take the scriptures from a place of honor before reading lends the sense that the shelf or alcove holding the books had some kind of cloth or other means of marking the sacrality of the space that held the book. Further instructions to read during nightly vigil also indicates that the monk likely had access to a lamp or candle of some kind for reading in dim light conditions. For sleep, the monks appear to have had a simple reed mat laid on the floor. Dadi Show outlines a prayer regimen within the cell, instructing solitaries to kiss individual nails in the feet of a crucifix, providing us reason to believe that uh, what surprised me for his craftsmanship as a crucifix was likely present in the cell. It also seems that Dadi Show was aware that such activities naturally lent themselves to exhaustion, a lack of focus, and to the monk struggling with the desire to fall asleep or to lean against a wall for support uh, he offers a brief anecdote he has heard. Some brothers apparently tie their toes with flax wire in an effort to use the pain to avoid nodding off or growing complacent in their ascetic pursuits. A kind of tactical deployment of embodied experience using pain to spur on spiritual progress. The cell would have a single door and a small opening uh, or aperture through which the abbot could speak with the monk. This point of community connection, even in isolation, is worth highlighting, as the solitary's well being and guidance was still the concern and domain of the abbot or rabban of the monastery. Isolation could be preserved for the, for the solitary being checked in on by not looking upon the person through the small window and keeping the conversations brief unless there was need to address an urgent problem within the cell. Instructions for the solitary to ration food without leaving the cell also tells us that some amount of stored food or jars for storage were available. Once our monastic novice has accustomed himself to the daily and weekly rhythms of the monastery, adjusted their circadian cycles to dawn prayers, late vigils and working hours, committed songs and prayers of the Psalter to heart, maybe not all 150 of them, but a portion, and perhaps even readied for a cell as a solitary, the work of the monk shifts to what is described as its highest level, the work of the spirit. Throughout their career, monks are instructed to monitor their thoughts and recognize the stirrings of their bodily passions. These agitations were often attributed to demonic influences. Satan and his demons were often portrayed as uniquely threatened by the advancement of monks in the way of the angelic life. And so these demons took many forms to try to pull monks away from their progress. When a demonic influence or bodily passion was recognized as a threat, it was the duty of the monk to rebuff this psychic intrusion. The most common response was a prayer, recitation of scripture, or act of repentance. One common version of this is found in the Antoreticos, 
a demon combat handbook written by Evagrius of Pontus. Evagrius was a fourth century monastic author from Asia Minor who took up the monastic life in Egypt and whose theological musings on monasticism, the eight evil thoughts, the workings of the mind, and more were deeply influential in Syriac monastic theology and are among the most readily translated and cited Greek works on the topic in Syriac. His models of the response and categories of demonic attacker are reflected in the likes of Joseph Keziah, whose treatise on the three steps of monastic life engages with identifying demons and responses to their attacks in Evagrian terms at several points. Offering counsel on recognizing the internal motions of demons and the means of repelling them, Joseph, like Dottie Show, finishes with a reminder to the solitary in the cell that they are still part of a larger community and suggests that it is vital to seek help from a guide should the individual struggle be too great. Through the elevation to a solitary, what uh, the Rabban indicated a level of trust and confidence in the monk's ability to pursue ascetic disciplines without constant communal oversight of the koinobium. But the master disciple relationship did not end with the retreat to the cell. But not all spiritual disciplines were about the negation or refusal of outside influences. Vital to the work of the spirit for the solitary was the cultivation of a disposition of piety and an approach to a life closer to that of the angels who exist in perpetual prayer. To this end, the emotional growth of the ascetic was looked upon as an important step in the progress of the soul. Moments of weakness or doubt were to be met with meditations upon the coming judgment and a recollection of one's personal sins. Self-accusation was a tool for building humility and dependence upon the mercy of God. With this hope reliant on an external mercy, the outward expression of such a disposition often took the form of tears. Monks moved to tears of sorrow over their sins or tears of joy at the overwhelming presence of the salvific power, particularly of the Eucharist, were looked upon as paragons of the ascetic curriculum. Monks early in their disciplines are instructed to work toward this emotional state by offering sighs and visualizing judgments and punishments that the sinner deserves and looking to the work of the elders of the monastery who more readily give tears. Dottie Show writes the importance of remembering early sins in the passage then raise your voice with the spiritual cry of your mind and recite the following prayer until you reach the measure of those old men who have labored in prayer, who at the end of every psalm recite the doxology and a prayer, and who hardly recite 10 psalms in the long vigils of midnight and onwards on account of the wonders that happen to them through the divine grace. Weeping, tears, sighs, spiritual visions, divine consolations, and revelations of the spirit. As long as you are a novice and young, recite the doxology and the prayer which we describe above with a mournful voice at the end of every, every marmitha, at the end of every shubaha, and every third marmitha. Years of such preparation, res reflection, recitation, and repetition helped the monk build in emotional responses and connected their, to their expression of tears and laments. While treatises written for monks do not suggest their piety could lead them to the performance of miracles, such a thing would be a vainglorious goal indeed. Histories about monks highlight that particularly holy individuals are capable of being channels for divine intervention. Mar Cyprian, namesake of one of the monasteries in the region of Marga, is given a particularly massive catalog of miracles performed, including exorcisms, the curing of paralysis, healing disfiguring injuries, and receiving visions. Cyprian is, by Thomas of Marga's account, truly a wonder worker, though such tales abound in hagiography of monastic devotees. The monks performing these miraculous deeds would deny it is their own power. Rather, they are vessels or intercessors that lead to God's intervention. Despite this, the details of Cyprian's exorcisms include a particularly formulaic rite for blessings to cure illness, and uh, expel demons that raises questions about how aware someone like Cyprian might have been of their state of piety. At the end of this survey, then, of the educational dimensions of the monastery, we'll leave our imaginary novice and I'll move on to a few closing remarks. <laughs> 
While the Church of the East remains an understudied branch of the late ancient world, it's my hope that this work and discussion today brings to light for you the fascinating and deep world of the East Syrian culture and literature. By a reading of these sources with a mind toward the place of teachers and students amid these various avenues of education, I propose we can see the monasteries of East Syria situating a place alongside and within larger religious and academic frameworks of the Persian Christian experience. The way that these monasteries utilize canons of rules and cycles of prayer, fasting, vigil, and worship are vital elements of the process of self-deconstruction and self-reconstruction in which a novice reshapes their patterns of life to a monastic mold. Central to this process is the abbot, whose duty to speak with and discern alongside the monks, both in the quinobium and in the cells of isolation, oversaw who was elevated, who was disciplined, and the particular and personal elements of their practice. Dadi Show cautions that overzealous pursuit of too great an ascetic burden is one of the pitfalls for the solitary. And it was the abbot's role as a guide and pedagogue to ascertain the burden a monk could bear and when the novice was overtaxed. By looking at the monastery as a center for training, a parallel but not quite congruent counterpart to the theological academy, we can see the intersecting blurry lines between centers of religion, education, and church service in Persia at this time. Uh, thank you very much. I have assembled here, if you are interested in the topics for today, uh, some readings that I think are accessible to non-specialists in the field if you would like to pursue more deeply any of these uh, questions or thoughts. Uh, but I believe we will go ahead and leave open at some time for questions at this time. Uh, Dr. Cates. Hi, thanks so much, Peter. That was terrific. I really enjoyed that. Oh, I'm wondering if you would mind going back to the visual that you had before your bibliography and just yes. tell me what's going on there. Uh, yes, let me get my screen share set back up. But the short version is, um, so that is one of my personal favorite uh, devotional icons. Um, it is uh, called the Ladder of the Ascent or the Ladder of Virtue. Um, and so what's taking place in this icon in particular here is that the, um, the monks or the spiritual athletes are on this ladder trying to rise from the bottom left to the top right, where you can see a portrayal of Jesus in a kind of enthroned position, um, welcoming those who have ascended this steep ladder um, with the portrayal of demons across the bottom of the portion uh, with long spears and forks trying to pull people off. Uh, one of them uh, hanging out on the left of that ladder towards the middle there has a bow and arrow to hurl thorns at people. Um, and then you can see a kind of collection of angels and saints in the top left and in their counterpart, the uh, current still living church in the bottom right, encouraging these athletes in their pursuits. Um, it is an icon that is meant to represent the difficulty and rigor of the ascetic life and its pursuits, uh, as well as the dangers that the demons who hate monks in particular uh, pose for those trying to attain this kind of connection to God. Thanks, that was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, yeah, thanks. This is very interesting. Um, of course, very far from my own field. Uh, but I do, you know, uh, work on a tradition that also is very strong and monastic. And so I kind of wonder about parallels here, you know. Uh, so, so one of the things we, uh, I was thinking, because it sort of relates to work I've done, is uh, you talk, you start to begin, uh, to begin, you start talking about reforms and so on. Um, now that, uh, in my sort of situation, very often point to competition that, you know, different groups try to kind of uh, 
show that they are more holy or more correct or whatever than other groups. I just wondered uh, if, I don't know if it's going to take you too much away from, from your main point here, but uh, I just wonder what kind of uh, uh, insight you have on that. Yeah, um, so the reforms of Abraham take place um, in part because of two or three different pressures, one of which is competition. Um, so I didn't want to get too deep into the kind of doctrinal disputes going on, but essentially um, before Abraham's lifetime, by about a century, there is an event that gets remembered as the Beth Lapet Synod. Um, as a collection of bishops where led by a particularly controversial figure named Barsauma, there is uh, a shift in allowing um, priests and monks to marry amongst themselves. Um, we've lost the actual canons of the synod for the most part, but there are some, uh, some evidence that this is how it's remembered at the very least. And this is seen as just this travesty for asceticism of the Church of the East. It is just the single worst thing that ever happened. Um, and in fact, the, the canons that we do have from a different synod two years later um, show Barsama letting off of that position, but it's remembered in this legacy of the church as this just stain that lasted until things got reformed because people just didn't listen to this fact. And during this time between Barsama's reforms and or between Barsama's attempt to allow monks to marry and permitting um, the kind of reforms of Abraham, we get the kind of rise and spread of the West Syrian church as a unique institution separate from the East Syrian church. Um, and Jack Tannis has a wonderful book called The Makings of the Medieval Middle East, where he looks at the kind of competition between East and West Syrian churches before the rise of Islam and the role that schools and um, public preaching played in the attempt to win these people back and forth. Um, and so a lot of East Syrian sources remember Abraham as restoring the great austerity of the ancient asceticisms um, that undoes the problems of uh, Barsama's Beth Lapet Synod. Uh, but also in that process, um, the the invention requires them to point farther back to say, no, we're the real good asceticism, not like these West Syrians don't do their asceticism, even though people thought they were more popular at the time. Um, and so we've got all these kinds of internally competing ideas of what makes for good asceticism and how to respond to a complicated history. Hopefully that helps address some of your question there, Dr. Schleer. I'm happy to take any other questions if anyone has one. I, I don't want to uh, take too much time, but since there are no other questions mm -hmm. right now, let me ask you this. I was real interested in the, obviously, practices intended for the formation of emotion. And I noticed that in your description, I know you can't cover everything, but in your description, you focus especially on fear and uh, guilt and humility. And I'm just curious if there was much discussion of love and, and how people kind of understood the love of God and whether there was sort of an erotic component to that or anything we know about it. So uh, there is quite a bit of uh, discussion of it. And what's interesting is that the kind of cultivated sense of love that you do get at high levels of asceticism once you've gone through this. It is a love that grows out of that initial fear. Fear is a spur toward the ascetic life and it's through reflection on that fear about that judgment that eventually you come to love the God who will save you despite the fact that that is the God in judgment who should rightly condemn you. Um, and so you develop your love in that, um, in that context. Um, and the, the monastic re reaction to the notion that this would be erotic would be a horrified no, um, because the idea of even any kind of uh, lustful thought is immediately a demon of any kind. And yet the kind of discussion of love, um, I think you can read a kind of, um, a kind of 
erotic attention to it in some of the ways that they are looking for. Um, not necessarily because I think they're trying to express any kind of sexual desire for God, but because in the face of trying to describe that love that they will explicitly tell you defies words, um, the, the words that fall into that same register are kind of the closest they can imagine or try to get towards, um, which is a just fascinating thread to follow through there. Interesting. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, I, I do have a lot more because it's just interesting to compare, but maybe it's taking us too far away from your, your topic. But, but can I just ask a little bit about the monastic organization? Because you talked about the role of the abbot, right, as a kind of uh, being in charge of things and also as a spiritual advisor, it seems, right? So that's very similar to the Buddhist temples, that uh, Buddhist monasteries and colonies that were done. But besides the abbot, there would be in a, a Chinese Buddhist monastery, a whole slew of other offices, uh, you know, that different. I just wonder, and, and then, you know, the way to become an abbot would be typically to, you know, go through various of those offices. So very few people become an abbot straight from the rank and file. Like even if they're considered spiritual or advanced, they would have held various kinds of offices. And so they'd have the sort of authority of having held those offices, plus a kind of idea that they were spiritually accomplished and then, you know, receive an advocacy, advocacy somewhere. But I just wonder what the situation is, was like and you know, what you know about that. Yeah, uh, there were uh, there were definitely some sub offices, um, although the role of the abbot is what always gets emphasized. Um, and in part because the abbot is responsible for the care of the solitaries, and it's the solitaries in particular who are usually the ones writing or the center of the accounts. Um, but we do know that there was a kind of head of the, let's call it the dormitory, where the, um, the Kenobitic monks who haven't yet earned individual cells are living in groups of two or three at a time. So you have kind of a head of the area there. And you will have some people who are responsible for overseeing the library. You would have a head scribe. You would have um, some just different facets would have these people in charge. And then the abbot would also have a collection of people responsible for things like standing watch at the gates, um, who are you know just making sure that people are only coming and going who are supposed to. Um, and so you do get a little bit of this hierarchy outlined. Um, but despite the existence of those positions, um, so many of the monastic authors want to attribute everything that happens to the will of the abbot. They want to make the abbot the center of everything to the point where someone doing their job out in the library is just an extension of the abbot's desire for them to do so. Um, and in a world where you're naming the monasteries after some of your founding abbots or the name of the church up there could be after an abbot. Um, it's just interesting to see a world where personal humility is supposed to be so important you put up on a pedestal uh, your leader who is uh, so dear and no one could ever draw ne next to. And it's usually the successor who puts up the abbot who becomes the namesake at that point. Okay. Uh, anybody else? All right. Well, if I uh, began the meeting, I will uh, call it to a close. Please join me once again in thanking our speaker. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for your attention and for bearing with me while I share stuff in a language that ho hopefully some of you now know exists. Take care. Okay.